Okay, so we're gonna focus on like a high level conceptual model of 2D arrays first, and then we're gonna dive into how does Java actually represent two dimensional arrays. At a high level perspective, just think of a two dimensional array as a table, um, a Google sheet. There are a certain number of rows, there are a certain number of columns, each cell, so for each row and each column, there's a value of some sort. That's all a two dimensional array is. Right? And often we use it to, to capture, to model a table of information, just like we would use a Google Sheet for. Technically, Java doesn't have the concept of a 2D array. So the way that we create 2D arrays in Java is with an array of arrays of integers. Right? Um, so I'm going to show you like visually kind of like what that looks like. Um, first, a little bit of syntax. Creating two-dimensional arrays is really pretty easy. Um, if we have a second dimension, we just add a second pair of square brackets. The way I would read this is, I think it makes more sense from like right to left in terms of the type. It's an array of arrays of integer values. That's what a 2D array really is. So we add an extra square bracket here to specify the second dimension of our array. And so we add an extra square bracket here. Usually we do everything row and then column. So when I say new int sub 12, this says create a two dimensional array with 12 rows and 50 columns in each row. That's it, that's all it takes. Now, when I wanna reference a specific value in that two dimensional array, a specific value in that table, the first in the first square brackets, I specify the index of the row. So here's row index three, the fourth row. In the second square brackets, I specify the index of the column. Here's the column index six or the seventh column. And this will return the value in that specified row and column. That's it. Here's a better representation of how does Java actually do this, okay? So computer memory isn't, isn't two dimensional, it's, it's one dimensional. So we can't like put a 2D array like right in the computer memory. Um, so what Java does instead is Java creates an array with the number of elements equal to the number of rows. So here's an array with four elements for four rows. The value of each element in this array here is a reference to another array where the number of elements is the specified number of columns. So we have four rows. The value of each element is a reference to an array of integers where each of these four arrays has five elements filled with different integer values. Okay. This is how Java handles the concept of a 2D array. It helps us visually to think of it as a table arranged like I drew it here on the screen, um, even though that's not exactly how Java actually builds it in the computer's memory. Pretty much everything we do in this class, we're gonna do what's called, we're gonna build our arrays as structured here, where we first specify the number of rows and then the number of columns, and we index it based on row and column. And so it looks like this. Um, this has a name which you're expected to know. Um, it kind of seems like an odd inclusion in the AP curriculum, but it's there. Um, this is called row major. Um, think of row major as meaning the row comes first, right? So the, the array is actually, each reference in here refers to each individual row. Or with the square brackets, the first thing we specify is the row index. That's what row major is. Like I said, pretty much everything we're gonna do in this class is gonna be row major. But you're expected to know that there's also such a thing as column major, a different way of laying out the data where what goes in the first square bracket is the column index first. So it's column and then row, right? There are applications where this there'd be a good reason to do this. Um, we're not gonna get into that at all. Um, but you should be aware that there's two different ways to lay out a 2D array. Um, and it's all a matter of what comes first. Do we specify the row first so that each 
value is a reference to a row? Or do we specify the column index first such that each value in the array is a reference to another array that represents the column? Yeah. Um, so be aware of those two terms. Assume it's row major, although usually you're told. Um, or if you're creating it, you probably just want to create it row major as well. That's, that's by far the most common approach here. then. I think I'm using the Java Visualizer tool again because I think this does a really good job of helping us visualize how Java is actually storing this in the computer's memory. A um, couple things I'll show you in this code snippet. Um, we can use nested for loops to initialize the 2D array. We can iterate through all the rows. We can iterate through all the columns. We can initialize each and every element. We can also use an array literal. Um, it's just that now we still use curly brackets for the array, but each element in this array is itself another array which represents the row, um, the value for each and every column. So, and that's in its own pair of curly brackets. Java doesn't really care about white space. So I think it's really helpful when we use an array literal for a 2D array to space it out like this so it looks like a table visually. So it's clear like, oh, here's the first row. It has values one, two, three, four. Oh, here's the second row. Here's the third row um, and so on and so forth. So this helps us build a visual conceptual model of the 2D array. But I also think it's important, well, it's definitely important to understand this is what Java really creates, okay? So the variable matrix here, its value references the array. That's not new. That's the same as what we've been doing with arrays the whole time, right? The value of an array variable is a reference to the array in the computer's memory. Here is the array it references. There are three elements. The value of each element is itself a reference to an array, okay? Specifically an array of ints. So the value at index zero is this highlighted reference which refers elsewhere in the computer's memory to an array with four elements with the integer values one, two, three, four. And at index one, we have a different value, a different reference to another array with four elements with values 11, 12, 13, 14. And finally, like here at index two, a third reference to our third array with these values here. So yes, it's really, we can think of it as this, this table of rows and columns, but from a Java perspective, it's really an array of references to arrays of integers. That's how it's all stored. Most of the time, we can just focus on this picture in our head and everything's gonna work out fine as we use our 2D array. There are times, however, and this often shows up on the AP exam in a free response question, where the College Board is going to assess to make sure do you really understand this model over here. And the way they do that is they have you do some sort of an operation that involves an entire row at a time. Because each element in this array here referenced by our variable matrix is itself a row. What that means is I could create another array here highlighted in yellow and another array of integers with these values 101 102, 103, 104, 105. So I'll step over that line of code. Here's a new array with five elements with these values. The type of new row is an integer array. The type of each element referenced by matrix is also an integer array. So I can totally change the value of one of the elements in this array to refer to this array instead. And that's what the code highlighted in yellow does here. This says take the value of the variable new row, that value is the reference in red, and copy that value into the element at index one in the array referenced by matrix. Here's the array referenced by matrix. Here's the value at index one. If I step over this line of code, the value of index one now refers to this new array, this new row, 
we just basically replaced a row in our table. So the first row is still one, two, three, four, but the second row is now 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, and the third row is still 21, 22, 23, 24. The other interesting thing this shows is that two-dimensional arrays don't have to be like rectangular. You don't have to have the same number of columns in every row. Because from Java's perspective, each row is just a reference to an array. It doesn't care how many elements are in there. Every row could have a different number of columns. Does that happen a lot? No, right? Often we're modeling a table and every row is gonna have the same number of columns, but it, could, it can happen. There's times that's useful. So now the, highlighted, the code highlighted in yellow here, matrix sub one, sub three says, look at the variable matrix, follow the reference to the array, go to index one, so that's the row we want, follow that reference to this array, go to index three and return this value, copy this value. So we're gonna copy the value 104 into the variable value. And I hit step, sure enough, the value stored in the variable value is 104. Okay. This level of understanding is required for the more, more advanced operations we do on two, with two-dimensional arrays. together. Um, I'm a big fan of the Olympics. So we're going to write a class that basically is a metal table um, where each row is like for a different country and each column is for the number of like gold, silver, and bronze medals. So let's click on the new class button. Let's call our class metal count. And we'll open that up. I'm going to delete, we're going to do our own instance variables. I guess I'll leave the constructor. We'll clean that up in a second. I'll get rid of their sample method. There we go. So we've got public class metal count. Um, we're going to have a few instance variables. I'm going to create an instance variable, uh, which is a constant, um, which is the number of countries and therefore the number of rows in our table. So I'm going to say private final int countries equals seven. We're going to have seven rows in our table for seven different countries. And then I'm going to say private final int metals equals three, meaning we have three different types of metals, gold, silver, bronze. So our table is going to have 21 values in it, seven rows by three columns. Cool. As we saw in the little Java visualizer example, but it's definitely worth a comment here, is that we, oops, we can use, can use array literals to create 2D arrays. And we do that by nesting curly brackets. So the syntax for this, a little bit different because now we have a second dimension to our array. So I'm still gonna make this instance variable private. We're still gonna store integer values in the array, but we don't have a one dimensional array. We have a two dimensional arrays. So it's two pairs of curly brackets. And I'm gonna call this instance variable counts. So again, I would read this as an array of arrays of integers. And then we can say new int, array of arrays, so 2D arrays. And since Java doesn't really care about white space, I like to lay out my 2D array literals so that they're really easy for me to visualize as a table. So here's my first pair of curly brackets that will define the overall array. Um, each element in this array is gonna be each row in the table, which needs another pair of curly brackets. Um, just going to make up values here for our seven rows for the seven countries. Let's say the, the country here at index zero, one gold, zero silvers, one bronze. This right here highlighted 
is an array literal. So the value of the first element in this array is this array of three elements, right? So we're building this up in the same way that Java models it. All right, second row, one, one, zero. Third row, uh, zero, one, zero. Fourth row, one, one, zero. Zero, one, one. This country hasn't won any medals yet, but they'll get one, I'm confident. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rows, three columns, 21 values. Perfect. Honestly, the values aren't very important, but we need something here to help us out, so. All right, here's our constructor. We don't have an instance variable X, so I'm gonna get rid of that. Um, what I guess I wanna capture here is that when we know all the values of all the elements in our table, in our 2D array, an array literal is a great choice. Sometimes we don't know that. Sometimes we might, we might be reading those values in from a file, um, or we might be calculating those values. Um, at the start of the spring semester, we'll do um, some image manipulation type stuff. So the values, we're, we'll use a 2D array to represent pixels in an image, um, where each element is going to be a color. Um, so that's going to be read from a file. So it, it kind of, you know, it depends. But what we could do if we can't use an array literal is the alternate way, way, alternate way to create a 2D array is as follows. Um, we can initialize it and then the initialization would be followed by nested loops to initialize each element. Now, I don't want to actually write, like, I'm going to leave the code for this commented out because we already initialized our array, but just for completeness in our notes, we would initialize the array by saying this.counts equals new integer 2D array of integers, where the number of rows is the number of countries and the number of columns is the different types of metals. So it would look like this. Very similar syntax to what we wrote previously with our create evens array and create odds array. Um, and then we could have a for loop of some sort to go through each and every row. And we could have another for loop inside of that to go through each and every column. We're not gonna code this together because we're about to write a method that does a very similar thing to iterate through all of the elements in a 2D array and print them out. So we're gonna get to see what the nested for loops are gonna look like there. But sometimes this is how we actually create and initialize our 2D array as well. So here's what I think is the cool thing about what we're gonna learn today in terms of like array algorithms. We're going to write three methods. And the first method is going to be how do we iterate through, how do we visit every element in the 2D array, every cell in the table? Okay. The second method we're going to write is for a given row index, how do we do something for every value in that row, meaning we iterate through every column for a specific row? We're going to total up the, the number of metals for a specific country. And then the third method we're gonna write is given a specific type of metal that is a column index, how do we iterate through every row to do some operation in terms of all the, all the values for a given column? What's cool about this is once we see the structures and the loops um, and how to set them up to iterate through either every row and column or for every column in a given row or for every row in a given column, that covers all the possibilities. We're going to do a simple like sum algorithm for most of these. 
But what's neat is once you can iterate in these three ways with a 2D array, you can combine that structure with any of the other algorithms we've written before. Um, and you've just like multiplied by a factor of three, the number of different ways you can like solve problems, which is cool. So that's what's gonna be neat about what we'll be able to do after today. So let's start by visiting every element um, in the table. Um, and we're gonna basically write a method that's gonna print the entire table. So let's do that. Quick java.comment, what will this method do? It prints the entire table. Relatively straightforward. So this method will be public. We'll have a return type of void. We're gonna call it print table. And we need to, so whenever, if we want to visit every element, that means we have to visit every row. And for every row, for each row, we have to visit every column. Hopefully that sounds like a nested for loop because that's, that's what it is. Um, so here's one tip. When we're writing our for loops for 2D arrays, please name your loop variables row and column to help you keep track of whether you're dealing with rows and columns. It gets really confusing if you use like I and J. It gets really, really confusing if you use X and Y because like rows and columns are different than a coordinate system. So stick with row and column and you'll avoid a lot of, uh, of mistakes. So I'm gonna create a local variable here for my outer for loops, int row equals zero, start at row index zero, continue while row is less than countries, increment row each time. That loop will allow us to visit every single row in the table. For each row we visit, we want to iterate through every column. So I'm gonna create my inner for loop. I'm gonna name my loop variable col, short for column. Uh, you can certainly spell out column. I don't know why, I just like the sense that they're both three letters. It's just kind of weird, I guess. Column equals zero. Column is less than metals. And column plus plus, there we go. Now that we're going through every column for a given row, we can just print a value of that element. So we can say system that out dot print. We don't want print line because we want to stay on the same line. And the way we index this, this is this dot counts. What row do we want? Well, whatever the value of the row variable is. What column do we want? Whatever the value of the call variable is. So we'll print that and let's concatenate a tab character on just so it looks really nice in our table. Once we finish printing all of the values for a given row, then we can do system.out.print line to go down to the next line. If you're like, this looks kind of familiar, um, that's a good thing. This is a lot like the nested for loops that you wrote for the diamond or like the nested for loops you wrote on the last exam to do the brackets thing. Same type of approach. The outer for loop goes through each row, the inner for loop goes through each column. Okay. It's just that now we're dealing with a 2D array instead of like printing stars or brackets or stuff like that. To prove to you that this works, I can create a new metal count object. I can call the print table method and we get a nice table, just like what we initialized it to. So we're off to a good start. With this, this structure here, we focused on printing values. You could totally use the same nested for loop structure and sum all the elements in the table or calculate the average of all the elements in the table or count how many elements in the table are greater than two or whatever it happens to be, right? You can use any algorithm that we've already learned in the context of this nested loop structure. All right, let's say we want to know how many medals did a given country win so far in the Olympics? 
So let's write a method focused on that. So here's our java.comment. Sum the metals for the specified country index. And really what we mean by the country index is the specified row, right? Give me a row. I'm going to sum all the values in that given row. I'll iterate through every column. Therefore, we need a parameter now. We need the country index. What row in the table are we going to sum? So the index of the country in the table whose metals to sum. That's awkward, but OK. Um, and what are we going to return? The sum of, I'm going to copy this because it's the same thing. Cool, there's our documentation. Oh, I'm sorry. I just realized I jumped ahead a little bit. All right, we will write this method. Don't worry. Let's go back though and look at this. This print table code, it works. Like we ran it, it built a table. It could be better. Um, here's the potential issue. Let's say I go up here and I like delete a row. Okay. So now I've only got six rows and then I run the code again. It's going to crash. We're going to get an exception because I forgot to change countries to six. All right. So here is a better practice. A better practice is not to hard code the number of rows and metals. We never need to do that because the array itself knows how many rows and columns there are. So I'm going to put a comment in front of this and I'm going to label this good because it's good. It works. But let's write something better. Um, Something better would be instead of hard coding, even with a constant, the number of countries is to use the array itself, this dot counts, and ask the array, hey, how many elements are in this array? And the number of elements in this array is the number of rows, right? Because we have an array of arrays of integers. So the length of this array is the number of rows. So that is definitely a better approach. So I'll put a little comment here. This is better, okay? We shouldn't hard code the number of rows. We should use the length of the array. Similarly, for our inner for loop, this is good. It worked. But we can write something better. We shouldn't hard code the number of columns either. We should ask the array. But this is harder. Like, how do we get the number of columns in our array? If we go back and look at our visualization, to get the number of columns in our array, the length of the array is the number of rows, so that's not helpful. But if we go to the index zero here and look at the reference stored in the array, that refers to a given row and the length of this array is the number of columns. So it's just like an extra level of indirection. So we could say this dot counts sub zero dot length. So that says, get me the length of the array referenced by the value at index zero. What is the length of the first row? Is another way of saying that. Question. I am so glad you said that. All right, so to repeat that for everyone. So this is better. It will, this works. Well, here, more important question. Why would it be better? Why would it be good not to just hard code it to zero? Yeah. Right, in this case, Every row has the same number of columns, but it doesn't have to be that way. Each row could have a different number of columns. So that was better, but here is best, okay? So exactly what, what Ashwin recommended here, instead of using zero, let's use the value of row. Get me the length of the row we are currently iterating through. That is the best approach.
So obviously I wanted to kind of work through this incrementally going from something that's good that works to something that's better and then the best approach here. And I encourage you all when you write your nested for loops for this type of approach, you might as well do it the best way, follow the best practice. Excellent. All right, now we can actually write this method to sum the metals for a given country index. That is sum all the values in a specified row. So public method, it's gonna return an int. We'll call it sum metals for country. Takes one parameter, which we said would be called country index. Yes. Oh, good questions. Could we use enhanced for loops? Absolutely. Um, we could even use nested enhanced for loops to write this whole method. Um, and that would totally work. In my experience, and this is why I, I modeled it this way, enhanced students do really, really well with enhanced for loops with one dimensional arrays. And students really, really struggle to get the types correct and understand what the values are when doing nested enhanced for loops, okay? Um, you might not have problems at all with that, in which case go for it. Use nested enhanced for loops if it's appropriate. Um, but over the years, it seems like sticking to just using square brackets to do rows and columns when we're dealing with tables seems more straightforward and more easily understood. That's the only reason why I wrote it this way. It would totally work with nested enhanced for loops. Excellent question. All right, if we're gonna do a sum, we need a local variable. Let's call it sum and initialize it to zero. Eventually we're gonna return it. And all we need to put in the middle here is some code to iterate through every column for a specific row. So we do not need nested loops here because we're only gonna look at a single row, the specified row, and we only need one for loop to iterate through every column. So again, please, if we're iterating through columns, name your variable column so it doesn't get confusing. So int column equals zero, column is less than this dot counts. Um, sub country index dot length. We need the number of columns in this row. And then we can say column plus plus. This line of code is essentially the same as the highlighted line of code up above, right? This is how we write a for loop to iterate through every column in a specified row. We just have a different variable for the row. Okay? Inside of here, super simple, sum plus equals this dot counts. Uh, what's the row we want? Um, country index, that doesn't change. Same row always. What is the column? Well, whatever the current value column is. That's it. That's how we sum the value of every cell in the specified row. The hardest part of this method is getting the number of columns correct, right? If you say this.counts.length, that's the number of rows, not columns. So you just gotta be careful with your conditions for your for loops. Let's do one more method, final method. All right, so if we summed all the elements in a given row, the next thing to do is sum all of the elements in a given column. So we're gonna sum the metals for the specified metal index. How many gold medals have been awarded so far in the Olympics? So we're gonna do it for all countries. So for a given column, we're gonna iterate through every row. So for all countries, i.e. the specified column. 
So our parameter will be the metal index, which is the index of the type of the metal type in the table to sum for all countries. And our return value will be the sum of, I'm going to copy this again just to save time. It's the same thing. Whoa, there we go. Make this method public as well. It returns an integer as well. We'll call it sum metals for type. And I'll take one parameter, which is the metal index. And we're still going to need a local variable sum, which we'll return at the end. This is going to be very similar to the method we just wrote. Once again, we do not need nested for loops. We only need one for loop because the column isn't going to change. The column is going to be whatever value is specified by metal index. So we only need one for loop to iterate through every row. So let's give that a shot. Whoops. For int row equals zero. Row is less than the number of rows in our table, which is this dot counts dot length. The length of the array is the number of rows. That part's a little bit more convenient. And inside our loop, we can just keep incrementing sum by the value of this dot counts. First, we specify the row, which is our loop variable row. Then we specify the column which doesn't change. It's always going to be the value of the parameter variable metal index. Perfect. So again, now we've written together methods that iterate through every row and every column and can operate on every value in a table. And we could apply that to whatever algorithm we need. We also have a method that for a given row iterates through every column. We summed up the values, but we could do any algorithm we want. And this third method now for a given column iterates through every row. We summed the column. We could do whatever algorithm we want there as well. So this gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how we can do different types of operations on two-dimensional arrays.